Hello, Scott. Thank you very much for joining us. So please feel free to take your stage. So there is Scott Byington from Queen, Queen City Roasters. Forgive me for mispronouncing your name. And thank you very much for joining me, Scott. And welcome, Scott, to our stage. Thank you very much. All right. Much. Good morning, everyone. And we're down to just a couple here, huh? <laughs> I think we need to maybe get some coffee coffee flowing here and wake everyone up. Uh, so yeah, thank you so much for the introduction. My name is Scott Byington. Uh, I am a uh, coffee roaster here in town in Denver. Uh, along with my two brothers, we own and operate uh, a coffee roasting company called Queen City. And uh, yeah, I want to talk today a little bit about what it means to be involved in relational trades. Uh, so I, I came into the coffee industry actually uh, through a non-traditional route. I came into coffee uh, working on the farm side of things. So my background is in international development. Uh, I have a master's in rural and environmental sociology and I was working in southern, southern and central Africa uh, with farmers on uh, issues around rural community development. And the issues that we were looking at often spanned complex issues that weren't dialed down to just one problem of uh, access to water, or access to healthcare, or access to uh, the, the marketplace, or whatever it was. What, what we came to see that in these contexts of rural community development, there was a whole myriad of problems and issues that couldn't be solved with just one single, uh, one single thing. And so, as I was interacting with these communities and that nonprofit kind of mentality, that philanthropic mentality, uh, what we came to realize is that always going around begging for money and begging for uh, corporate social responsibility might not always be the best way to pursue um, development. And what really might be needed is actual transactions in a conscious, uh, conscientious way rather than just going out and handing things out to communities. Um, so yeah, I, I entered into the coffee world that way, learned how to roast. Like Doug said earlier, all great things start in a garage started roasting out of my garage, um, and hopefully we can keep on the path of Project Cure like Doug was talking about, or keep on the path of Nirvana, <laughs> uh, and get to that, that point where all good things come out of a garage. Uh, so yeah, we, we started up uh, roasting coffees that came directly from the farmers that we had been interacting with um, in these rural development uh, fields that, that I had been yeah, involved with for some time. Now, I'm not here to talk about myself. What I'm really here to talk about is why relationships matter. And what Doug was just talking about in that presentation beforehand is the perfect segue into this. When he was talking about that third P that he brought up of being in person, this is what I want to talk to you about today. And we'll use coffee as kind of the snapshot, the case study for this, because of what's happening in the coffee industry as we speak right now. Uh, if you're in tune with what might, be, what might be going on in the coffee world, we're in what is often called the coffee price crisis. Um, to me, it's not necessarily a crisis of price, but more of a crisis of priority. Um, and, and I'll explain that in just a little bit here. But where we're at in coffee is that there are 25 million smallholder producers of coffee around the globe today. And coffee has grown in a tropical region, it's called the Coffee Belt, um, that has to be within a certain uh, latitude across the globe that the coffee plant uh, is able to survive in. And so that coffee belt spans what is oftentimes some of the most impoverished countries here uh, on our globe. And so what happens is, is most of the individuals that are producing coffee for our daily consumption are smallholder farmers in rural communities in very impoverished areas. And there are big producers uh, in the world. Brazil is a great example of one uh, that are driving the international market and the the irony of that is oftentimes these smallholders have to participate in that, that larger international market that is being driven by large producers such as Brazil. And that large market is known as the C market. Um, there's futures tradings that are done in New York and in London. And the C market, the coffee market, is the international kind of baseline for how much coffee is priced at. And so right now the C market is at a historic low. Um, it's the lowest it's been since 2006, where we're hovering right around a dollar per pound. And that dollar per pound, it, it got down to about 94 cents about mm, five, six weeks ago. And that 94 cents to a dollar per pound is what a farmer, a smallholder farmer, would be entering into a trade negotiation with a buyer and saying, okay, here's my coffee, how much 
Are you willing to pay for it? And based on the C market, that buyer will walk into that conversation and say, well, the C market is at a dollar per pound. I think your coffee is all right coffee. I'll pay you C market plus a little dividend of 50 cents a pound or if that's a really nice coffee. If it's not a nice coffee, then they'll just stick straight to the commodity price, the C market price, and say, no, we're gonna pay you a dollar per pound. And in this negotiation, that smallholder farmer is required to, or if he's looking to sell his coffee, he has to participate in that internationally set C market pricing. Um, so we can see here, this is the trend of the C market as it works its way downwards. And now this might be, just be, you know, we can talk about all the reason, reasons behind uh, international markets and pricing on in commodities tradings, futures tradings, and all of that. I don't want to get into that today. What we really want to talk about is why we ask smallholder farmers to participate in an international market that has no bearing on their cost of production. And so this farmer entering into that conversation oftentimes is looking at what it costs them to produce that one pound of coffee and it is nowhere near close to $1 per pound. It's closer to $1.20 to $1.50, but it's context driven. And so to ask a farmer in Guatemala to be paid the same price for a producer that's producing in Brazil, or same pro producer that's producing in Rwanda, that pr is gonna be totally different. Their costs of production are gonna be totally different. And so for us as uh, coffee buyers in Queen City, what we do is we prioritize the context and the relationship of the producers that we choose to work with. And the, the key to that is to come alongside the, the producer and have, as Doug was talking about, have that relationship. To be able to stand alongside them, to be able to know them in person and not to Skype with them, um, but to be in person and to say, okay, what is your cost of production? And oftentimes this is where that relationship comes in key is that many farmers might not know their true cost of production. They might not have had the training, the business training, to look at margins. They might not have had access to a market before to really gauge, okay, well, what is the quality of my coffee? What is the true price of my coffee? And so when we choose to enter into a relationship with our producers in our supply chain, it's to come alongside them and not just say, have a transaction, but it's to have that other P that Doug was talking about, the partnership. And when you're in a partnership with a producer, you're coming alongside them and say, I'm not trying to extract the most gain out of you. I'm coming alongside you to see you succeed because your success is my success. And so when we look at a supply chain that is based upon relationships, we're looking at a supply chain that is not about transactions. It's not about being driven by the largest margin possible, but it's about being driven by the sustainability possibilities of that partnership between the two, the two parties involved in the, the partnership. Um, so one of the big issues as well in coffee with this price, this price crisis that we're facing, and when I say this, it's more of a crisis of priority, is that when we enter into these, these contexts of trade relations with a particular producer, um, it's not just looking at price, but it's looking at that complexity of the relationship that the producer exists within. And so it's not just about asking, okay, what is your cost of production, but it's asking what other challenges are you facing in the production of your, your product. And in the case of coffee, there's some major problems that many producers are facing today. One of the big ones that you might have heard about is this thing called Roya. Uh, coffee leaf rust is the other, uh, other name for it. And it's a disease that is the outcome, um, or is a, is a product of raising temperatures and growing conditions um, in that coffee belt that I mentioned earlier. And as temperatures are rising uh, in this coffee belt, there's a fungus um, that is called Roya that has become, that has just started to explode around the coffee belt. And what this fungus does is it chokes the coffee plant, and so the production of the plant itself, the plant will live with Roya, um, but the leaves will get all splotchy and, and has this little rusty color to it. And what that does is it takes nutri uh, nu nutrition away from the seeds, from the, the coffee chairs that are being developed. And so a farmer, if his entire, uh, farm of coffee plants gets Roya on it and Roya spreads very quick, uh, then his production levels will actually begin to drop. And so the, the amount that the coffee plants are able to produce drops. And so this farmer who used to be able to produce maybe 500 pounds of coffee cherries per year, now may only be able to produce 350 pounds of cherries per year. 
and those cherries that he is producing then will also have uh, lower nutritional content. There's less sugars, um, there's less meat on the coffee cherries themselves, and so the quality of the coffee that the farmer is producing drops as well. Now, a farmer that is facing Roya has a couple of options. One, they can turn to pesticides, and they can try to root out uh, the fungus by spraying all their plants with pesticides, but pesticides cost money. And if you have lowering prices on the international market, the sea market dropping, and you're being paid 94 cents per pound, that 94 cents will not cover your cost to spray your fields. And so then a farmer is left looking at, okay, if I can't fight Roya with pesticides, what other means can I do? Now there's some options as far as uh, looking at organic fertilizers and being more intentional in your picking, and there's a whole cleaning process that can go about to remove uh, dead foliage around your plants, but that takes time. And time, as we all know, is money. And so if a farmer has to spend the extra amount of time cleaning their fields in order to fight Roya, and they're only being paid 94 cents per pound, then you'll, you start to see this cycle of at what point does it continue to make sense to produce coffee. And so the crisis that we're facing now in the coffee industry is that many smallholder farmers are actually leaving coffee production. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time in Guatemala uh, where we worked with a group in uh, a region called Yepo Capa. And the farmers there, most of the farmers that we interact with are 50 years or above. So they're, they're an older generation of coffee farmers. And the reason you see this age, uh, it's very evident when you're out in the coffee farms and the farmers that you're interacting with. And the number one reason is that the farmers tell us is their kids do not see a future in coffee production and so they don't choose to pick up the family trade. So you have families that are at three, four generations into coffee production that now the next generation is leaving because they don't see a future. It's not a sustainable system that is currently in place. Uh, another thing that you see uh, with the farmers that we work with is that they, they can't pay their basic uh, livelihoods. It's, it's coffee itself is not a, uh, a sustainable livelihood for these rural producers. And so they turn to other costs uh, or other ways to make a livelihood. A lot of times uh, in the last two years that I've been down in Guatemala, actually, I've seen farmers that we used to work with tearing up their coffee plants to plant something else. Uh, sometimes uh, you can see this being replanted with uh, illicit stuff like coca, because um, that has a much better market. Uh, you can also see it being replaced with things like cacao as the chocolate, uh, specialty chocolate market is beginning to take off as well. Um, but a lot of times it's tearing up the, the coffee plants to go back to uh, basic, basic agriculture like potatoes, sorghum, things like that, and then telling their kids to move to the big city and send remittances back to the, the farm. And so it's, it's created a system of non-sustainable rural livelihoods for coffee producers that are engaged in this, this global market. Uh, the, the final kind of implication for the, the, pr the coffee price, price crisis that we're seeing uh, is migration. And that's obviously a hot topic here in the US. A lot of that is uh, being driven in a not often talked about way is that you have many coffee farmers in South and Central America that can no longer make their livelihood doing their traditional uh, coffee farming. And so they uproot and they leave and they come to a market where they think that they can make a better livelihood. So where does that leave us? As we're facing this, this, this crisis, uh, it does lead us back to that relationship, that context matters, that knowing your producer matters. Um, and I'll give a little example here, a case study, if you will. Um, this is Don Mingo. Uh, he lives in a little town uh, called Kisache in Yepo Kappa. Uh, it's a uh, Kechi Cal uh, traditional community. So the Kechi Cal are an ind indigenous group to Guatemala. And Don Mingo, he's been farming his entire life. His father before him was a coffee farmer as well. And Don Mingo's kids, as I had just talked about, uh, are no longer in coffee production. When I first met Don Mingo about three years ago, he was thinking about giving up coffee farming. Um, he was kind of on, into his last season. He wasn't seeing the results that he, was, he had been hoping to see uh, with some of the interventions that had come from agronomists on the Roya. Um, he just couldn't continue to pay for the pesticides necessary to fight Roya. Um, and he was left in this 
pretty dire situation of just saying, I'm gonna give up this thing that I've done my entire life, and I'm gonna have to find something else to do. So we started to talk, and uh, Don Mingo and I, and through a, a buddy of ours who does exporting out of Guatemala, and I just told him straight up, here's a couple of steps that we could do to get coffee um, to the quality that would be necessary for us to purchase. Um, if you can do these steps, and if we can get your cup quality to be at an 85 on a 100 point scale, like I will purchase this coffee because I know what an 85 point coffee should cost, um, which is around $4 per pound. Uh, I will purchase your, your harvest for, 400, or for, for uh, $4 per pound, which is obviously way more than the 94 cents per pound that is the sea market. And Don Mingo's eyes kind of got wide and he goes, holy shit, that is, <laughs> that is incredible. He's like, that would be, that could cover my costs of my labor, it would cover the cost of my pesticides, it would cover the cost of uh, my kids being able to go to school, it would cover everything that I would need if you could purchase this coffee at $4 per pound. And to give you a context for that, we turn around and sell, and this is not specific to Queen City, this is to, uh, to many coffee companies here in the US, any of the specialty ones that you might interact with. Roasted coffee here in the US can be turned around and sold for anywhere between 16 to 22 pounds, uh, dollars per pound. So for us to be purchasing at $4 per pound is not taking a huge hit out of our margin. This isn't an unsustainable business practice for us. If anything, we see it as a positive, sustainable business practice because it allows our producers to stay in the game. It allows our producers to find success. It allows our producers to find meaning and livelihood um, out of their coffee production. So what ended up happening with Don Mingo, we went through that first season, we got his coffee quality up to 85, and he produced out of his, his plot of land, he was able to produce about five bags that were at, and a bag is 152 pounds, five bags that were at that 85 um, price point. Uh, and so we bought that for four bucks a pound. He saw the, the effects of that and he said, okay, next season, I'm gonna take the, the money that I made from this first five bags and I'm gonna reinvest it into my, my coffee plot and I'm gonna be able to produce half of my coffee plot next season, 20 bags will be at the 85. And then he took the margin from that because we told him that we'll purchase that and he turned it around and this third season, we actually just landed his coffee about two weeks ago in our roastery and he would produce 40 bags of 85 plus coffee, almost the entire lot that he produced aside from uh, early harvest stuff and we don't need to get into that, but the bulk of his coffee that he produced this season um, was 85 plus and was done through a relationship with a buyer that knew the context of his production. And so he wasn't producing this into the void and saying, hey, I hope someone, I produced it in 85 and I hope someone will come and purchase this. He had the confidence and the security of a relationship to know that if he were to invest in his product, if he were to invest into his coffee, he would see the dividend payoff in the end. And so really what, what I'm trying to get at here is that those relationships do matter. So whether you're in coffee or if you're in whatever other international trade, if you have a supply chain that you're interacting with, the relationships and the context of that supp supply chain matter. And to be disassociated from your producers, to be disassociated from those across the supply chain leads to systems that are disassociated from true sustainability. So the more that we can get to know the people at the base of our supply chains, the more that we can get to know the margins of their production, the, the needs of their production, the context in which they're living and producing, uh, these are ways for us then to create more sustainable supply chains. Um, yeah, so I, I, I hope that coffee itself is around in 20 to 30 years. Unfortunately, that trend that you saw on the sea market shows no signs of abating. Um, if I can say one thing to you about coffee is if you're out drinking coffee and purchasing coffee, please do find a coffee roaster that is uh, aware and cognizant of these uh, relationships and the cost of production and the, the farmers that they're interacting with because to be quite honest, uh, we are facing in the coffee industry uh, a pretty harrowing 20 to 30 years where coffee is gonna be, uh, <laughs> might not be around in about 30 years if we don't kind of fix the systems in which we operate. And one of the main ways I do believe is to get back to the roots, back to the relationships, and to understand the context in which it's produced. So go drink some coffee, uh, wake up a little bit. <laughs> and yeah, thank you so much for your time.
Thank you. Wow, what a great, inspiring case study. Thank you very much, Scott, for sharing with us. This is great. I enjoy my cup of coffee. Now one more reason to enjoy it today. Thank you. All right, I'll see you back here in 10 minutes. We are going to be listening to Deborah Lodge from HSBC. So 10 minutes. Thank you very much. <laughs>